Thank you. We're glad to see you. Yeah. And hello, everyone. Good to see you. And you. And I see a lot of faces I recognize. Yeah, you see Miss Jill Thornton there is there in the middle, for instance. Hi, Jill. <laughs> Say hi. Hi, Jim. Hello, Judy. I'm Judy glad that, Oren. I'm glad that Jill didn't get uh, tossed away. She's bad with maps. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about who these folks are. Sorry, I didn't catch that, Darlene. Uh, Tell me about this gathering and why you're all together. Yes, this is the follow-up follow module from the LTS we ran last year where we had five modules. And Lauren, you were with us for the first one uh, at Grimerud. And this, we are about 80 people, uh, leaders in YWAM Europe from about, I think, 19 nations, if I correct it correctly. And uh, yeah. we're here in Estonia, in the city of Tallinn, in the old city of Tallinn downtown, in a big Pentecostal <laughs> church. And we are, I think, experiencing great days. This is our first full day. And Ben Fitzgerald from Awakening Europe is, with, he is with us today. He had a meeting with 50 pastors in this city while we were here praying. And he will be with us the whole day tomorrow. Tomorrow night we will have an open meeting. Uh, the Evangelical Alliance in Estonia has invited for an open meeting with us and with Ben. So we are going to fill this house, hopefully. Uh, to be packed with people, and um, we are here to dream, to think, and to consider, uh, conspire maybe to, together for Europe, because yeah. we believe we believe God has a plan for Europe, and we we dream and we long for His passion to get more of that in our hearts for Europe, and uh, and we are asking the question: What could happen uh, in Europe? And what is God's plans and what is God's passions and how can we link up with that? And we thought having you in, you know, it's such a privilege for us. And um, Thank you. such a privilege. So we're looking forward to hear what you have on your heart for us tonight or for your morning. <laughs> yes, it is very much our morning. <laughs> well, first of all, I should tell you that we have survived well the fog in the law. We're doing lots of ministry on that side of the island and uh, doing our best to help relieve some of the suffering that people are going through. So this morning, um, because we want to talk so much about vision, it's only right that it's Lauren that starts our time and gives us that big picture of what he sees God's heart is. And then, you know, if he doesn't do a good job when he walks out the door, I'll try to fix it up. But not really. Those of you that know. <laughs> Those of you that know us know that that's the way our gifts work together. Lauren has this strategic part and this vision, and then mine sort of is, if that's the word of the Lord, then how are we going to do it? Yeah. So we're just really looking forward to being with you this morning. Yeah. So Lauren, <laughs> over to you. Yes, we do have 3,500 refugees now. On the other side of the island, that's that's a hundred miles from us. That's uh, what 160 kilometers. But uh, we we have uh, now over 500 homes that have been taken away, and this is in the affordable area of the Big Island. It's only one percent of our island that we're talking about. But I just thought I'd mention this. And whenever the Lord told us to come to the Big Island, this was in 1973. I said, Lord, they have volcanoes over there. He said, you go where I tell you and you will be safe. And it's Kailua Kona where he sent us. And at that time, not one grocery store was here. And uh, we had to go up, up to another town to get our groceries. There were only cows next door to us, maybe a hundred of them. And we had goats all over the place and donkeys and so on. But uh, it was Cowtown. And the Lord said, it's going to grow to the right and to the left. Today, we have 15 billionaires living up here to my left right now, north of us. And uh, people like Mr. Dell of Dell Computer, Mr. Schwab, Charles Schwab, uh, you know, and many others. He's living in a $62 million home. and 
Dell in a $102 million home and so on. And so we are watching the growth in every direction. But the mountain behind us, there are three mountains on this island. And uh, they're quite high up. We Two of them, we get snow on them every year. But uh, we also have the one right behind us. It's called by the locals, the mountain that saves. Because the flows go every other direction, but this one uh, saves us from the from that and a lot of the bad weather as well. So uh, we just want to give you that little update, but we are trying to figure out how we can take uh, maybe up to a hundred families over here onto this side of the island. And uh, we're working this afternoon with the mayor who has, I mean, both the national, uh, federal and, and state and local, that is county, the island, uh, all of the leaders are working together to try to solve a, a terrible issue. We have people camping out on church parking lots over there, and we're trying to find out how we can serve them. We do it around the world. We are doing it for, you know, Syrians uh, in many countries now. We're doing it for Afghans. We're doing it for others. We've done this for years. But now it's it's right around uh, our neighborhood and so we're and we're ready to receive international teams yes thank you very much especially those that can speak uh, Hawaiian pidgin and uh, we we are we're grateful though today as I talk to you I I want to bring in something that is really uh, interesting and important to all uh, of us in YWAM, we don't realize sometimes how, how things work together. So I'll try to make the big picture little first and we'll, we'll go from there. But let's bow in prayer together and ask the Lord because he's there, he's here, and we're gonna ask him to do what we cannot do. Lord, we need the touch of your anointing, therefore we need your presence. You said, lo, I'm with you always. And that was tied to the Great Commission. We're here Amen. for that reason. Amen. And we want to say, not only do we need you, we want you. Amen. Because we love you. And we love you in that relationship that you've given to us, not only through you to the Father, and by that, the Holy Spirit. But we love you because you died for us. And we see you, Lord, crucified as a crucified king of the universe and yet the power to rise again and so lord give us that resurrection power of understanding give us what your vision is give us your understanding and we'll do our best lord to follow you and we'll do the little you do the big and we thank you for it in jesus name thank you amen how you live My there. first remembrances in the world was in a place called Summerton, Arizona. It was right on the border with Mexico. Mexico and uh, the state of Sonora. And so we could walk to Sonora, Mexico, because it was only about three blocks. And uh, I, I wanted you to meet a man here today. How many of you know, how, from the Nordic nations there, have you heard the name Louis Petras? Hands up so I can see the hands, hi. Okay, how many know the Philadelphia Church? I think that's where you are in, in Tallinn, right? Are you at a Philadelphia church? All right. But anyway, you know the churches, all right? Uh, the grandson of Louis Petras was Arnie Peterson. Some of you remember Arnie Peterson as our leader in East Africa. And his wife, her name as maiden name, was Robbie, we called her, and Robbie, you betta. 
I have her brother right now with me. I want you to see his face. I want you to come over here just a minute. Uh, this is Frank Ubetta. And uh, Frank, let me just quickly say, can I give a little bit about your other side of your family? Sure. Yeah. All right. Frank Ubetta from the Ubetta family, his father was a teenager in my father's little church, Somerton, Arizona. And he had just come to know the Lord. Now the Ubetta family from Sonora originally uh, came to Los Angeles just like his father uh, brought the family to Los Angeles. And uh, just say hello to our leaders of, of uh, Europe. Hello, welcome. Nice to see you. God bless you. All right. Now, he, the way these families came together is very interesting because the Ubetta family became the major drug pushers in Los Angeles, not his family. They were the only ones that didn't really. Well, almost. Anyway, and they did live in Rodeo Road up in Beverly Hills and made lots of money and so on. And uh, the police were always afraid of the Uveta family. They just, you know, they'd pass by it and go the other way because they were powerful. And yes, many of them went to prison. But his father was really mentored and discipled with my dad and mom when I was just three and four and five years old. So I just wanted you to see something here that started very small. Now our families never, you know, we didn't live very high in the world. His relatives lived very high in the world, but they went down very fast too when the, they finally were brought before the judges. But his father took the book of Proverbs and decided that he would be a plumber eventually. I'll just cut to the chase of a few things. And, uh, and he would give everything he could to the Lord. And it eventually became what, 70%? 75%. And I, I just wanna say this about Frank. I was just with him where he lives most of the time. He's on about a 50 year old couch in his little office upstairs and he's not married. And so, I don't want to say anything. Anyway, this is the way he lived, very simply. But they've been able to give millions of, of dollars to the kingdom because of the way they live. So they are partners with us in the kingdom of God in so many ways, but partners with so many organizations. Uh, you know, a crew, we call it now, Campus Crusade, and many others have, have been blessed through the Ubetas. And so I just thought I would show you something, and then I'll move on and give you what God's put on my heart. I believe that there, when Jesus said there are four soils, we have to ask, because the seed is put in soil and it thrives, it multiplies, even, well, let's go for the hundredfold. I know there's 30 and 60, but I would like to talk to you as leaders about the hundredfold. Let's go for that. And uh, as we do so, we, we think about soil, as a farmer would, but this is a metaphor for our hearts. Our hearts are either hard soil, been walked upon hard. Now that doesn't mean that soil can't be changed and we have to cultivate soils around the world. And then we also have to think the rocky ones, we have to remove the rocks. These are obstacles to the kingdom of God and the flourishing of the seed of the gospel and the presence of Jesus. And then the third is the, the weeds that choke it out, the cares of this world, the love of money and so on. And uh, when I see the Ubetas, I know 
They don't have the love of money, but they just simply give and give and give, and uh, and yet live very simply. My father and my mother were met just before they died. Frank and his father, Frank Sr., came to see them just to thank them for what God had given to them in their lives and set them on the right track. And they always told them, what did you use the word? Masita. Masitas. Because my parents couldn't speak Spanish. And so they said, now, now Frank, use your masita. He's a teenager at that time, his father. And uh, of course, that doesn't mean anything uh, in Spanish either, but it meant it became use your brain, do the right thing, understand what you're to do. And dad would take his dad, uh, even as a teenager, he'd take him to meet with all the pastors, you know, and the presbyters and so on. He was so proud of Frank Ubetta as, as a young man on fire for God. But he was guided into ministry only in the business world. And they've done amazingly well, but, and Frank, you know, he, he's, he's done well in the marketplace, the stock marketplace and so on. All of that is, is focused on what we're focused on. And that's the kingdom of God. And they're just as dedicated as we are and maybe more so. So the soils, as, as you look at the, the four soils, it's the good soil that we want to be planting in. We cultivate the other ones, all right? Now, as we cultivate them, it starts with our heart. Our heart is the soil. Guard your heart because you're either going to receive what the Lord has for you or you're not. And if your soil is not one that, that is already full of nutrition and full of readiness to receive what God has, then we're not going to get the full blessings. So we are the soils, but it doesn't stop there. It goes into our family. Now, a family, righteous family, is good soil. The U.S. family, good soil. And, and they, that's the way they were all raised. And all of them, you, you begin to see what God can do over now generations. And this is where we are in YWAM. We are moving over generations. And people normally expect a mission to level up at the first generation. But God somehow has allowed us to go beyond that. And the, the, the understanding of the soil in families should go into cultures, ethnicities. They, they can be good soil, entire cultures. And in fact, a Luther, Martin Luther's good soil helped to lead us into reformation that created what we call Western civilization. Now, all of that, as we understand the big picture, is what we're dealing with when we talk about the world. So I was just down earlier this morning, thinking of a population that we're moving toward in the 2020s. They expect us to reach 8 billion people on earth. Now, how, how do we look at those 8 billion? You look at them in terms of the soil we have and what can be produced out of that soil in the roots, the trunk, the, the branches, leaves, and fruit, and then the fruit has the seed for the multiplication. So we're, we have to go with understanding of multi multiplication. So I'm gonna switch metaphors on you and jerk you into a, another world here in just a moment. But as, as we think of soils, think of households. That out of 8 billion, there's 1.6 billion households in the world. Now that's round figures. It's like in America, they, they're giving us round figures on obesity. They say about 20% uh, of Americans are, are obese. Now those are round figures, of course, <laughs> in more ways than one. So as I give you round figures, 
Okay, fight later about the details, all right? But today we're gonna to stick with the, the big picture here for me. And when we, we think about 1.6 billion households, how do we get there? What should we do? So this is where we have the KISS principle. The KISS principle of YWAM is not the one that others talk about. It's keep it small and simple. And as we look at that, we begin to see the multiplication. So now I take you to, away from Matthew 13, back to Mark 6. And there we see another metaphor that Jesus gives us, another picture. Now this one has to do with multiplication. And so as we go back to that understanding, we see Jesus coming and he's tired and he's trying to get away and they find out where he's gonna land and they rush down there and there's about 25,000 people there. Again, round figures because 5,000 men plus their wives and children. So you have all of this numbers of people and Jesus looks with, on them with compassion and he begins to teach them. And I, I just see him pouring out of a tired body, a good lift for the people and depth for their understanding. And then the disciples came up. They are implicational thinkers, good managers. And they said, Lord, send them away. They're gonna be they're not only hungry, but no place to eat around here. You know the story? Let me say it again. This is a story for YWAM, and God brought it home for YWAM. It's about fish and bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. But we also see that we need bread at times. And this, this was the situation. And what I like about what Jesus said is what he's saying to us. You, you feed them. You give them something to eat. You know, these disciples are, are taken aback. They said, well, to feed this crowd, we couldn't even make that much money in a whole year. They were white women. And uh, they just didn't have that kind of money. There's no way they could do that. And what they were thinking of is taking on the whole load themselves. Not, they were leaving Jesus out of it. Now, all they were, that all they did is they had to get 12 baskets. And the Lord doesn't tell us in the word there of where they got the 12 baskets, but, but they were all empty. So yeah, there, there must have been some empty baskets around. Now, those baskets being empty is really what we are in this metaphor. You and I are the baskets. Now, as I was reading this again the other day, it just hit me again. There's, there's something amazing about the miracle that we follow. In that miracle, Jesus said, go see what you can find. What do you have? And that's what we need to look. Don't look at the masses and say, I don't have enough. Because Jesus is saying to us about the masses. He's saying, you do something about them. So bring the masses down to what we do have and then ask for multiplication. Now that's, that's what Jesus was showing us how to do this. It's not just for him back then, it's for us today. And so uh, they came back with the, you know, the five loaves and two fishes. The five loaves were, you know, some of these smaller loaves. And uh, two fish. We really don't know how big they were. I was looking for pictures today, but we have a miracle. And it's in our, it's in our history about fish. Think about what God did. Now, let me go back to the story first. He took and blessed the bread and the fish, and he put some in each basket. 
See, he broke it, blessed it, and gave it to them. And then he said, now you give it to the people. I used to think about this. Wow, did he, did he bless the fish? And then there's a big stack of fish. Well, no, it'd be rotten by the time you got to the bottom of the stack. The fish would, you know, they're in the heat, the sun, and so on. It wouldn't have worked. It doesn't work for us. It doesn't get stacked up. This is not capitalism. This is re, re, the multiplication into our lives for the people we are now facing. So we want to reach all of your, and Dar will talk more about the three C's. And as we, we talk about that, the Lord gave me that after our, our 50th anniversary celebrations around the world, 44 locations. And we met with, the, well, the ones that signed the, uh, covenant was 32,000 people. We have their names and addresses. And those 32,000 people uh, weren't all staff, but some of them were students and some of them were former staff. But uh, so about 60% about of them were staff. And, and then there was another more than 50% uh, could not come to one of our 44 locations. So you figure out how many people we got. I don't know. <clears throat> but it's nothing like our, our website says. And every time we raise the website number, we notice more persecution. So we, we stopped raising it. But uh, we're, we're, we're way up there now in numbers full time. And we're more than 2,000 locations, up blocks, I call them, operation locations. And so as we look at what we have, compared to 8 billion that we're going to have or 7 point whatever it is now, 4 or 5, it depends what day it is. But uh, as we look at, at what is before us, or just look at Europe, and as you look at Europe, understand you cannot finish Europe if you're not also concerned about the rest of the world because there's such an interchange, a synergy for good or bad in all the world at the same time. So look at Europe and yes, you've got to take care of Europe. You've got to take care, as the Bible says, of your own family or you're worse than an infidel. So you start with your, your nuclear family and you move on out, but you care for the world because God so loved the world. We must love the world. So everything we do, we need to picture it in the light of the whole world. It was born, the Reformation was born there because 20 languages got the Bible in Western Europe. And now we have to get back to how it was born. We need to see born again Reformation, or we call it now transformation. So you're very key in where you are. But with that, it was out of that Reformation that missionaries went at a new level so that they, according to Dr. Ralph Winters and Dr. Uh, David Barrett, their calculations were one out of every 69 in the world were followers of Jesus, not just cultural Christianities in the broad sense at that time of the Reformation 500 years ago. But by 1900, there was 1 billion people and it was one out of every 27 because the mission movement started to grow. And then by 1980, when they finished their, their work on this, the population was 4.8, uh, 4.5 billion people up from 1 billion in 80 years. And so now we're talking about 8 billion in the 2020s. So as you see that growth, you'll see that the Jesus followers grew faster than per capita than the, than the population because it was one out of every 10. Or if you say, well, I'm Norwegian or Swedish or whatever, I'm Christian. But you see, then it'd be one out of every four on earth call themselves Christians. So when, when you look at that, you know, all South America, they're all Christian. So 
when you look at the, those kinds of numbers, we have, what do we have? Well, we just have a few loaves and fishes. We're talking YWAM now. And, but even look at the body of Christ. There's far more people than are in even the ones that call themselves Christian. So how do we reach them all? Keep it small and simple in your mind. Keep it very clear. <clears throat> as, as we do so, we're going to find that God will take and multiply in us and through us into the world. We're the basket. He puts it into us, and then it's multiplied through us into the world. Now, I want to remind you of what happened over there in uh, Greece. We were just around the corner from our, our place that was rented uh, for YWAM was actually one, a hotel that had been uh, damaged during the earthquake. So it wasn't quite safe. So they said, well, missionaries can live there. And so we lived there. And I say we, I just visited there, but, but uh, we had 170 people living there. Any of you were there at that time? Way back here, and of course the Ords were there. Is that Jim way in the back? Anyway, you ask them what I'm gonna tell you. Because right around the, just around the bay from where they were was where Paul uh, lived. And he, I think he was out that, that particular time. He wasn't in, in Corinth at that time. Was he, Judy? I don't know. We'll have to ask the older y ones if they were, if Paul was there. Anyway, <laughs> oh boy, I'm in trouble now. But uh, as, as uh, they were just finishing up and they had a sort of a relay type 40 day fasting and prayer. Mustafa was a young man from, from North Africa and he was a, uh, came out of Islam and uh, went on the streets, I think it was Amsterdam where he came to know the Lord. But anyway, uh, he was walking along the shore, they had been fasting and a lot of them at that time even. And uh, so there he found 12 fish caught in a tidal pool. He waded in and caught them. Now fish are usually too smart to get caught in that tidal pool, but they did because they were there for Jesus. And he threw them out and uh, take them, took them to the kitchen. Well, that, that helped maybe put a little fish into something. We had a Norwegian cook. Some of you Norwegian understands, yes, uh, you love fish. And so he knew how, how to cook, cook fish. Then Becky from Texas was having, about three days later, sitting on a rock just next near the water and fish started jumping out. I think it's 72 fish that jumped out. Now I think of 72 because Jesus sent out 72, Luke chapter 10, but Jesus sent out 72 fish. Now they had something to praise the Lord for. This is, wow, this is something because the Greeks all said it's never happened before. This doesn't happen except in front of you people. And uh, so they had a day of, of Thanksgiving and somebody came in from outside and said, they're jumping again. And so they went out, kept praising the Lord and they photographed and counted. They vid videoed, I have those, I've shown them on TV in different parts of the world. But what happened th there that day was on the front page of the newspapers in Athens. It was on television nationwide. It became, because of our trial there, our, our court trial there, it became a part of the record of the government of the nation of Greece. But it's been told and seen in picture form around the world. I was grabbing, trying to find pictures this morning as I uh, was up early and trying, you know, I started here at 4, 6.30 a.m. here. And, uh, but I couldn't find the pictures. But I, I have pictures of the fish. And 8,301 fish jumped out. And they were cleaned. I saw a picture of them cleaning them. Some of the guys sitting half, half in the water cleaning fish. And uh, others in the kitchen. And here God multiplied for us something in, in the very area of fish that, that the message around that time for us was Mark chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. So the feeding of the 5,000 is in our history. 
And I want to walk through some history. Now, this is the first book. You hear it? Okay. This is made a bang. It's in 140 languages so far. And uh, I know in Guinea's Book of Records, the after the Bible, the number one book is in 127 languages. But uh, I don't know that Guinea's Book of Records know it, I, and we've never uh, looked at looked at it as that. But it goes because there's no royalties. It just goes, goes, goes into new languages. But it tells the stories of how God took nobodies to do, to reach out to everybody. That's what we do. And it's simply listen, obey, and don't quit. You get the word of the Lord, you don't quit. Well, it's tough, but Lord, I got it really bad. In fact, I broke my fingernail yesterday. No, it doesn't matter how bad it is. You don't quit. You don't quit. And so that's what we have to realize. And this is, was that really you, God? If it was, you don't quit. Now, millions have read this now, and uh, there, there are many of us around the world have seen, I've just been to Edmonton the day before yesterday, whatever it was, the last few, uh, four days, I guess, and uh, out, uh, up in Canada. And I wanted to, do, any Canadians there? Anyway, yes. Yeah, oh, I see. Yeah, Jeff and Tracy. Well, I told them up in Canada I would have the people pray for them because they live in igloos there in Edmonton, you know, Canadians. And uh, because of global warming, they're becoming homeless as their igloos are all melting away. And so uh, now they're, they're, all the Canadians are mad at me. But uh, anyway, I had to, had to shuffle myself. But uh, I, I can add that to the, to the ones up, up, you know, in the, uh, the far north of, in the Arctic part of Norway, too. I, I, I'll have to start telling that story. But they, they live in igloos. But uh, as, as we look and see what God has done, and up there, I, I, I was tracing the, the uh, history of YWAM in Canada and how in Arnie and uh, Heidi, of course, they were our founding leaders up there in uh, Canada, and they were there. And uh, how, how we, you know, drove across the nation and uh, when the roads were not even paved and got to Montreal and our, our heart was to get to every home a gospel of John, a, a, a little book called Here's Life to every home in Quebec and uh, also one for the children. And we got to, as far as we know, about two thirds of the, of the province of Quebec at that time, that's 1967. Then we had over 200 people, uh, YWAMers, there for the World's Fair that took place in Montreal. That was really our first big event for 200 people. And, uh, and so as, as we saw God at work, well, as we tried to reach the every and the alls, the, this is so key to us. And is that really you, God? If you have to, if you've ended up saying yes, I, I'm just thinking about the next book, a sequel to this. And I'm thinking about uh, something like creating with God or something to say what could happen when you obey. Think of what would happen if we would all obey all the time. That would be an amazing thing. We could get the job done, right? Anyway, that was first. But we're the basket. And God has multiplied through us, in us, and from us to the world. That's what happened to the fish. As they gave it away, it kept multiplying out of the basket. That's what we do. It keeps multiplying out of the basket. And then we learned Jesus is Lord. By the way, this one is in Korean. I, I, I just quickly grabbed some books at home. And uh, this one is in English. I think I can read that one. And uh, making Jesus Lord, that's the key that we must maintain. 
And of course, I begin the book with the, picking up Darlene, thinking she was dead, out in the desert. <clears throat> and that's where something in my heart had to go through a test. And the tests are simply the places where we learn the most and grow the most if we obey God in the test. And that's the point of Job. I was reading Job uh, recently, and and uh, I, I saw it from a different angle as I read it this time. He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, chapter one. That wasn't true, but he didn't have a Bible. In fact, Job is the first book ever written in the Bible. And, uh, and yet, he, he was saying, I'll trust the Lord anyway. He, he gave it to me, he took it away from me. Well, he didn't know because he hadn't had a teaching from Dean Sherman on spiritual warfare. And we got to think about spiritual warfare. He didn't know about the devil yet. He just thought it was all up to God, you know. And, uh, but God allows the tests because we grow in them. Why did he want us to grow? He wanted to give him double what he was missing because he couldn't do it unless he grew his character, grew his faith. And if you're in a test, thank God for the test so you can get through it and learn what it is in the test, not blaming everybody around you. Because the three free friends around him, of course, <laughs> yeah, they were the accusers of the brethren. And he knew that what they were saying wasn't right, but he, how can he defend himself? He didn't need to, didn't help anyway. In fact, he got a little bitterness in his heart. The reason I know, God had to tell him, you pray for them. <laughs> like he wasn't praying for them. He was complaining about them. But when he saw his Redeemer, and I, I'm right now starting to search through the Bible. I find Jesus in every book of the Bible. But I want to see Jesus crucified. Paul says, I preach Christ and him crucified. I can see that like, like in Genesis where, where God says to Abraham, you go up to Mount Moriah and offer your son as a, a sacrifice. We look back now and say, wow, that's not very Christ-like. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And he wants us to kill our kid, human sacrifice. He was speaking into a culture that that was normal. He wanted to correct the culture, the soil. And so he said, now go up there, tell everybody, they know what you're doing. You're gonna go up and sacrifice your kid. They did it all the time. Only he was told, go to Mount Moriah. And so he went up there, but he came back with his young son, and now they're going, well, you said you, yeah, but up there, he told me, I will provide myself a sacrifice. Where did God provide his sacrifice? On Mount Moriah. If you'll read that in 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter three, you'll see that Mount Moriah, Mount Zion are the same mountain. Mount Zion is where Jerusalem was and the extension of it cut off by excavation where it looked like a skull, so they called it Golgotha. And that's Calvary, which is Mount Zion, which is Mount Moriah. You see what he's saying to us in the Old Testament? The old is in the new revealed. The new is in the old concealed. So you see these terrible things that God says, you know, back there, now you do this. And, and they start to do this, and then they realize that that, that could be God, wouldn't it? So... So as, as we look at these, these understandings, make Jesus Lord in Europe again. How do you do that? Amen. Starting with you, starting with you. But don't just stop with Europe. If you do, you'll never reach Europe. That's the way it works. And then finance. This is very real. Now, People like the Ubedas are called to help us in financial ways, but we don't tell them what they have to do. 
<clears throat> they have to listen to the same voice of God that we listen to. And that's how God finances YWAM. We, we have to trust the Lord for our own basket. You know, he gives us a little bit, put it into our basket. And the reason I'm bringing out the books is many of us are forgetting that this is the history of YWAM that made Europe where it is. When I look at the history, the first five years we, when we started the first school in Switzerland, how many of your nations had a YWAM base in the next five years? Think of it. I'm talking by 1974, how many YWAM bases were there in Europe? That's five years. We started out with 28 people in our first school. We had about 30, 36, I think, in the second. And, uh, and it went from there. By the second, by 1970, we had already gone to Afghanistan, India, Nepal, by those first five years. And Floyd took the groups first into Nepal and India, and uh, Jan and Jim took the first group into Afghanistan, 1970, and got arrested, yes. And it wasn't all, you know, there were tests along the way, little tests, <laughs> right. So uh, if you look at Africa, you look at the Middle East. We were in Cyprus in the first five years, starting a base there, also in Lebanon, also in Egypt. We were also in uh, Morocco. We had a school going in Morocco, remember the Lichtes. We had them in West Africa, that's Joy and uh, uh, Joe and uh, Judy, took them across the Sahara Desert. Two years in a row, they drove to West Africa from Europe. This is out of Europe. They also started in East Europe. I think of Alf Magnus's Bakrit was went into with a team into East Africa East Africa. I I went to Mwanza. I traveled all day in an old school bus with uh, every everybody in there. I was, I was the only guy that was European looking. And uh, the guy on my left, there were three of us on this little school bus, and he had a bad throat problem, and he was spitting across me and the other guy out the window. And we went all the way through the Serengeti, all the way down to Lake Tanganyika, to Wanza. I got there at midnight that night because we broke down on the road and so on. I, I'm the only guy you know, <laughs> that was foreigner. And uh, anyway... There was Margarita and her team. Man, they met me, and they were all, they had already taken the town for Jesus almost. You know, amazing things were happening. This is, this is in the 70s, early 70s. And then I, I go to South Africa. It was Mona Rush, Mona Mush, I mean, she, she was rushing in. And Mona Mush was the one that went in there. And uh, her name was Jensen at the time, single gal. And she pioneered South Africa. Now, this was all coming out of Europe, guys. And this built, built, built Europe at the same time. Yes, Ross Tooley came to school there, went out and started in Hong Kong. And, and others, you know, we, we have some going into the other parts of the world. But mostly it was into Africa, Middle East, and Europe. And we were going into the Eastern Europe. We, we had a you know, vans fixed up so that this was some of our <laughs> German uh, engineering deals. And we hid all this, even YWAMers, most of them didn't know this, but our, our vans, you could put a magnet on the dash and the whole floor hydraulically opened up and you could put a thousand Bibles in there. We never got caught. We, you know, they closed up and there's no way to get into there except by that little magnet in the right place. And so we were doing things with the Truth Press International. You remember that? Anyway, printing there in, in the height of, in the Herlock area, in our castle, and so on. So all of these things are history, but they're not just your history. 
What is in your hand? What do you have? What's, what's in your basket? And as you think about this, what do you have now that you can now use to not just cover where you're, you want to saturate, but the world? Now, my next book was Who Should Be in a Mission? And this one is in Spanish. Por qué? No la mujer. And so this one is very important for this day and age. And we were ahead of the, the time. But uh, on the other hand, I thought, man, when we put this one out, we're going to get hit from every direction. I only got five ne negative letters in, in all the years that this has been out. And not one of them attacked what was in the book that we don't like that. <laughs> so that's their problem. But uh, in YWAM, we recognize this. But in mission, 60% are women. Then comes to this. And that's where I'm coming down to right now. What do we do to see Europe revive? This is called the book that transforms nations, the power of the Bible to change any nation. Why do I say Bible? Well, of course, we were founded on John, uh, Mark 16, 15. Every creature needs to hear the gospel. That's in our Magna Carta. That's the first one. But the second one, has to do with the soil, the soil of a, of a culture. First, our own soil, our own family. But in the culture, we have to have the word of God to disciple a culture. It created Western civilization. Out of Western, when the Bible with Gutenberg Press came to, first of all, the hands of the people for the first time in history in mass form. Now they could look at the Bible. Before then, it was mostly in Latin anyway. And only the priests knew the Latin. And they would speak in Latin in the service. People would come and knew something was happening. I love it. I love that uh, 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 big uh, cathedral up in Norway where they have on one side, though, the all the stained glass windows are the stories of the Old Testament, key stories. On the other one, key stories of the New Testament. That was their way of communicating. But you can't go as deep without the Bible. And so we've learned now, Matthew 12, uh, Matthew 28, verse 19, go and all nations, baptizing them. And the word baptizing is baptizo. And David Hamilton found out what the word baptizo was different from bapto in a recipe book back in the time of Christ. And so Jesus said, baptizo, that soak them. Like a cucumber soak it, soaking in it becomes a pickle. We have to soak them in the word of God. And without that, you're not going to be able to go forward. So right now, I believe that the... the the big attack that is coming on the Christians is coming from the news media and the governments. And they're coming down, 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 getting closer and closer. And uh, so, yeah, I, 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 we, we've got some challenges. But so did the early church have those challenges. And we will have to get the word of God out. Now, what they're going to do in the Bible is, is very, uh, very real. They're really going to attack the Bible because the Bible goes against some of their sins. And uh, right now, we just got hit in the media over somebody declaring something. And, uh, and it's, it's anti-biblical. And uh, so the media is looking for any individual. It's not a leader. It's an individual that says, you know, I am this, and, and they don't believe in this. But, but yes, we do. Yeah, we do. But without getting into all the social mess that's going on, I, I want to say to you that we are going to be hit because the Bible itself is, you know, Jesus said, I don't condemn you. Yes, and we are not to condemn people. But don't forget the second part, go and sin no more. And so we have to see both parts that we are not perfect, 
but we're grow what we're committed to be coming more like Jesus from glory to glory, letting him change us. And if we ever go the other way, Jesus warned us of wolves in sheep's clothing. And we're going to have some of that. That it will come and try to attack us from inside. And uh that, that's going to be a truth. Now, how do you control all of why? You don't. Know, God has to do it. But we need to be aware. And they're going to take the Bible and read some of the most gruesome things in the Old Testament and say, this is, this is the Bible. This is the Bible. But remember, that's why I'm saying God doesn't even defend his own character in the Bible, but Jesus defended God's character. <laughs> In, in the New Testament, when he died on the cross and he lost his reputation totally and completely and then got it through resurrection. So we need to get the Bible out. And so I'm going to talk to you about where I've just been is Mongolia. And Mongolia is at a time. You are, as you look around Europe, right now, Albania is more like Mongolia in Europe right now. And uh, in some ways you've got a lot of freedom, other ways you don't. But uh, depends on, you know, where you go. Pogradesh is different than say another city in, in another area in, in Albania. But when you, when you think about your nations that are there, think about a difference of Macedonia from uh, Germany. Look at Switzerland versus, uh, I don't know, pick a, pick a nation. And, and you have to think about the culture. The culture needs to become good soil. What tools do we have? We have the gospel. I, I'm thankful I just met with uh, the elite of the Jesus film. They've been here for several days. Uh, these are the top leaders in the Jesus film. They are so thrilled with YWAM because we've taken the Jesus film, by the way, is almost the whole book of, of Luke. So it's the word of God, word by word almost, and it's also the gospel. <clears throat> and it's, it's the salvation message. So you get that Jesus film into new languages. We sent out a team from here, trained by the Jesus people for, for two weeks. They went, five of them, into Papua New Guinea, and Papua New Guinea has 852 languages, one nation. They have 291 islands that are populated. It's not just the one bigger island, and that's only half, half for, for PNG and half for now Indonesia's Papua. And so, as we look at that country, Bill Gates said, it's an impossible situation. That's what he said. It's the one place I can't see how we can help them. And that becomes a challenge for us. And when we think of that challenge, the world will see the change. Another one is Mongolia. And Mongolia from a different way. Mongolia was under the Soviet Union they were taught over and over, you know, atheism. And, uh, and yet they were a Buddhist nation by and large. And, and they speak, 80% of them speak Mongolian, about 20% Kazakh. Then they have two little tribes that have their own mother tongue. We need to cover that nation. Because right now, the biggest nation on earth is trying to move in. And the biggest nation on earth the leader of them said, we must return to the most brilliant mind in all of history, Karl Marx. He said, we have to become communists again. This is the present leader was just voted in for life. And when you understand what the expansionism is, it's far beyond the good soil that they have been for so long. And he's trying to change all of that. And now for those that meet together in groups of 30 and all, they will have a fine 
of 50,000 US dollars when they have been meeting for a period of time. And they have cameras all over the nation with facial recognition. They have taken it to the fine detail so they know where the people are and which ones meet in the same home or the same restaurant time and again at a certain time. And so they are fined $50,000, US dollars. These farmers out there, they don't have that money. So, and then the home is also, or the cafe, a restaurant, is also charged $50,000. Or if they only meet a little bit in a smaller group, it's down to, and it's, it's graded. This is a new law as of January this year. They will be fined $3,500. That's the smallest fine you can get. So I'm leaving names out here, but understand they are now trying to move into Mongolia. Look back, 1988, Darlene and I went into Mongolia the first time. There was only one known Christian. He was in jail. 1988, then when the Soviet Union fell and uh, they were freed, the first team in was from Sweden. They started two churches in 1992, 93, around there. 94, I spoke at the, uh, the uh, Olympic Stadium in, in Berlin. They asked me to come as the speaker that day. 82,000 people showed up and they said, call us back to our roots. These are German roots. And so I did. I, I went through the history. This is why Germany was born, because they were still in the womb of nations whenever the Moravians started out with their prayer meeting, with their revival in the nearby uh, little town, and with their uh, uh, praying for the nations, and then going to the nations. And then out of that comes the Bible, where Martin Luther, in, in just 10 Ten weeks, I was in the castle where he was there in the very room where he uh, did his work. And I, I felt like I was on holy ground. And in 10 weeks, they told me 10. I've heard others say, no, it's 11. Well, they told me at the castle. So I talked to an old man there, so he, he must know. Anyway, 10 weeks. And he translated the entire New Testament. Now, the New Testament doesn't do any good if it's in the storage room. It's got to get into the hands, the homes of the people to make good soil. And that's so key to what we're doing. And like, you know, Elijah on Mount Carmel, he put the wood on the altar, but the wood is like the Bible. You know, it's got splinters in it. And the Bible says the letter kills, even in the Bible. But the Spirit brings life. So the, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, the Holy Spirit breathed on all Scripture. Now that was for the writing. And the Holy Spirit will breathe on Scripture for the reading. That's what you have to have. The Holy Spirit with the Word. And then as you give the gospel, you need to come in and make sure the Word of God is there. So that if you look at Franca, in the German movement, he got the word out first. And then he did all the schools and all the other things. But it was the Bible that he put out first. Look in the history of Germany. Look in the history of Norway. It was it's Hauga, from Hans Nielsen Hauga. I don't say it right, but Rude, Rude there it can help us. But, uh, but he took the, he said, everybody, get a Bible. And when he was given the Bible, he couldn't read, you know, at first. He had to teach himself to read. And he said, if that's God's word, see, then let them know this is God's word. This is God's word. And as we get the Bible out, we got to get it ahead of this terrible persecution that is coming. It is, it's going to be fierce, but the wave of God is going to be much greater. And the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth. How can I prove this scripturally? Matt, uh, in the book, help me, I, Isaiah chapter nine. 
And uh, it says there, you know, he's, he's our counselor and so on. But it says to the increase of his kingdom. Notice the word increase. There'll be no end. I'm telling you what happened with the Reformation by 1900, the increase is faster than population. The increase of his kingdom, there'll be no end. Understand that for a place like Europe, I lived there 11 years. I've been there every year for most of my life. I was there in 1960, first time, preached right there in Frankfurt, Germany. I was all over Europe at that time. And I was three, three months in Italy preaching all over from Torino, Palermo, tutti parte di Bella Italia. And so as I was there in Germany, I stayed at a place, uh, the, the address was 172 Eckenheimer Landstrasse. Look it up, that's where I stayed. And that's 1960. And I preached there at the, uh, the uh, Ascension time. And we, they were all out on Saturday, you know, a big crowd out in the forest. And uh, Bessler was the pastor. And, it, it, you know, as I look back to Europe, before a lot of you were there, I was there. I think some of you were born. Yeah, anyway, we won't talk about your age. But uh, as, as I was there, I saw a Europe coming up out of the rubble of the, of the war. In, in Italy, I, saw, I didn't ever see one pizza sold anywhere in Europe when I was there in 61 and 60. They, I was there. I was in Moscow in 1961, Pravda, I mean, uh, Poland, Prague in 61. I was in Prague, that's Czechoslovakia at the time, and uh, Poland, Warsaw, and so on. East Germany, I was there in those days, in those nations. I saw something then that I'm seeing right now in Mongolia. And there's a time where they're just so open. I, I know Holland had up to a half a million in, in an open air preaching time in, in, in Holland at that time. So many were coming to Christ. This is where Mongolia is right now. So I think God's going to teach us as a, as a, a people there's 600,000 homes in Mongolia. Now, we had for four days for, for, uh, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, call to all, we had 600 leaders. They now have 650 churches in Mongolia, and it's growing fast. They, the YWAMers, I met with them on Saturday, and uh, there's almost 100 full-timers but I met with the evening group and uh, these are the leaders. And I said, I wanna give you a vision and uh, I want you to pray about it, about the Bible, going to the homes. And they said, Lauren, we prayed before you came. And the Lord said, Lauren will come and tell us what to do with Bibles for every home. They said that. They said, we don't have to pray, just tell us. <laughs> God is wanting to do something. Now, I'm trying to say this is not unrelated to Germany, to, to Europe. Because when I spoke at the, the, uh, the Berlin Stadium, that was the day the Russian troops moved out. I began by saying today, because Jesus March also moved in that day. And I said today, the Russian troops have moved out, but the Jesus people have moved in. And that was on BBC Worldwide because we didn't know it, but BBC was there. And that's my first words. But then I got to the point, I said, we got to go now. You know, and, and one of the places I challenged him with was Mongolia. I, I Walter, Walter Heinrich, he, he's up at Ludenscheid. He, he was there sitting behind me on the platform. And uh, so I saw him a few months later, a year, three or four years later. I said, Walter, what have you done with my word? He said, we have sent a thousand Germans to Mongolia alone since you said that. And I found that's true. They went all over there. They were showing the Jesus film all over the place and so on. And a lot of them are still there. 
I talked to them. We're working together on this with them and crew and, and s several other organizations. We want to get a Bible of the Jesus film in Mongolia. Every home will offer it next year. And we have to do that. I see the other cloud coming. They're trying to take over that nation because there was a vacuum politically now. And the nation loves Korea most. They feel the closest to Korea. Any Koreans here? Anyway, the, the uh, Mongolians have a little blue mark on their lower back. They're born with it. So do Koreans. <laughs> so genetically, they're close. Not all Koreans, not all. Anyway, but when you understand, God is putting some linkages together. So next week, I'm back in Korea again. And I'll be there in Busan this time. And I'm trying to get something together. But Darlene and I spoke at the mega church in uh, Dallas. Four times Sunday morning, Bob Roberts, dear friend, and uh, Southern Baptist. And, and so the fact that she spoke there, you should speak to Baptists here. You know, because a lot of them don't believe women can do that, but she did. And uh, he went into Vietnam, went right to the president the head guy, prime minister or president, I've forgotten which, and said, "We, I found out that you have children that are in their late teens. I'm a pastor in Dallas of a church, and we'd like to help your children get an American degree at the university here in, in Dallas. We'll pay their way over. We will put them in the Christian homes to feed them and house them in our, our members' homes. And, uh, we will give them a four-year degree, and we will pay for everything. Man, the guy was over the moon. Of course you can take my kids. And then he went to the vice, you know, all the ones, the top leaders in the executive. Then he went to the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, did the same thing. He did that for the, uh, the uh, legislative. And when we were there, every service was filled, uh, not filled, but there were lots, dozens of Vietnamese young people praising the Lord. They were getting prepared to go back to change the soil back in Vietnam, the children of the leaders. So I'm asking Bob, I've been on, on text with him and I'm calling him, I'm talking to him today, uh, the pastor. I said, would you teach us how to do that in Mongolia? We want to go to everyone of the 19, 19, I think it's like Norway, they have 19 provinces, and uh, and they also have uh, precincts in Ulaanbaatar. So they have 600,000 homes, and if we have a 1,000 uh, teens, you're going to learn something how to do in Europe what you can do in, in Mongolia. We just want a few teams from Germany, and we'd like pastor to go ahead of time and talk to governors and say, would you like a, uh, a uh, degree in one of our schools and we'll house them and so on. Make sure they're in Christian homes that will disciple them. And then, then as a result, they will be open for us. We're, we're calling it a international youth cultural exchange summer. We'll do it in 60 days. And it'll be international young people from all over. And two of them will be from outside of Mongolia, one Mongolian. So three will go to 300 homes per month, two months. And we will have covered every home in Mongolia. But we'll take a, a gift because we're, we're, this is just a cultural exchange. Our culture happens to be the Jesus culture. And, and we're going to take a, the Jesus film and we'll have a SD card for the young people and uh, for the Bible, the Jesus film and teaching. And we'll have also a Bible for their home and a, a Jesus film for each home that doesn't have one. And so we're working with the Bible Society there. We're working with the other organizations. And as we do this, we want to saturate that country with the word of God before this other cloud starts to rain on that nation. They're already moving in that direction. And we have total freedom right now 
but this is not something you can count on in the future. So as we do that, the Weimarers have pledged, they, they will with the others, start a church in every village, every town in that country. And then in the precincts, we're doing the same thing in Ulaanbaatar. So that comes to the last book, and that is we can end Bible poverty now. And this is only out in English because other languages haven't picked it up yet, but I'm hoping somebody that maybe speaks another language here might get it published in your country. So this is telling, that's just a little hint, just a hint, but I'm coming to Europe. I'm going to find out <laughs> if you did anything about it. But there's, what it is, is how to do this, this project. And we will have coming satellites. And I end with the scripture in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Now, I know Revelation was written in the context of the time. That was Nero. That was all the persecution and so on. And they used symbols to uh, that the Christians knew who they were talking about, but they weren't using the names of the governments and so on. And uh, But it also, by the Holy Spirit, becomes for us in our time. Like the Old Testament, we don't go out around killing all Malachites and Hittites and Cellulites. We, we actually <laughs> had to throw that one in there. <clears throat> but uh, we are the ones that are spiritually in warfare. And we learn spiritual warfare from the Old Testament. And so as we look at the, that, that verse of scripture in Revelation 14, verse 6, it says that there is a messenger. The word angel and messenger are interchangeable. And the, the word angel in the Old Testament is often cherub. But here there's a messenger that is in mid-heaven, not in heaven, but it's, it's between us in heaven. It's mid-heaven, and it has the eternal gospel for everyone on earth. And it's every nation, every tribe, every ethnicity, every language. And now we have language recognition, ask Merkel, Angela Merkel, she can tell you, that can go from a satellite to her purse in her pocket or her phone in her ear, and she doesn't even know what's happening. But we can do that from satellite to every home, every phone, every smartphone, every device in their purse or pocket. And we can put there the Jesus film, the Bible, in every language, by language recognition, by their language, and without passing through cyberspace, without going through the internet, without going through terrestrial, those towers or anything else, just from satellite right down. We can do that. And we have the guy who is over the company, 800 people per hundred. He has no, no websites, no names on the door or anything. It's the most top secret thing of communication in America. And he, it's a personal company, but everything is top, top secret. And they will hire anyone because the government immediately pays it. And he has a little tag he always wears on his coat to work. He's the CEO of the head of this. It says, I love Jesus. He spent one week with us here in Kona. And through this kind of, he couldn't tell us most things. He'd say, well, don't go that way, go that way. That's all he could say. But what we are coming into is a time of total saturation. But we have to do the groundwork first in order for that to be sealed because we have to go into all the world because you have to have impartation. And impartation is not just done through information resources. We're using information, but the actual impartation that's going to come into the world still will be those in great persecution winning great numbers to Jesus. But the greatest move of God is one going to be far greater than the persecution or the hindrances because Jesus is going to overcome even 
He did it for death, hell, and the grave. He's going to overcome. And the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, which is Jesus, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Now let's get in ahead of all of this and get the word of God out. Get, get community started. We call them churches, but using the word church, it usually means a building for most people in the West. And so we, we talk about that. And also education for the young. And then we want food, drink, clothing, shelter, health care, and visiting the prisoners. We want that because that's what Jesus said in Mark, in Matthew 25, verse 35 and 36. He summarized it there. And so we want to do that because God's called us into evangelism, training, and mercy ministry. He's called us to do these things. But let's take the total and saturate, yes, Europe. As you do that, you will be saturating the Mongolians, the, uh, the Papua New Guineans, and other special places that will become to the world a testimony of what can happen in their own country. So as you think about 1900, 19 nations just now, and there's a lot more there in, in the European East and West, but as you think of your countries, there's none of them that cannot be reached for the Lord and, that, and if you will look and say, what do we have? As the disciples, they want to send everybody away because they first looked at what they had personally. But as they, we see what you have, there's enough right there for Jesus to multiply. Take what you've got, go for the big, go for the all, go for the every, and you will see the great commission fulfill, God happy, giving Jesus the glory, and we're going to, by 2020, we're working on at least getting some scripture in every language on earth by Christmas time, 2020. And it's going to be a surprise gift. No, we can't do that. Anyway, we can't surprise Jesus with it. But we can get this part of it done. And with our team that went out from here, they got the Jesus film in four weeks in eight languages. And that a half a million people saw the Jesus film in Papua New Guinea from a team in Kona in just four weeks, two weeks training, four weeks there, they were able to give it to them in their mother tongue and a half a million people saw the word of God in visual form, in audio form, and on, on, in that kind of open door, it just opens the heart of the people to come on in with the word of God itself in totality. God bless you. I know I, I don't want to take any more uh, time. Darlene said I, I'm five minutes over now, I think, of my time. But I didn't say a thing. You didn't say a thing? No, I did not. Well, you told me at home that. Anyway, <laughs> I, and so I, I give it now to her. Yeah. They're going to have a break. They want to do some questions. Okay. Thanks a lot, Lauren. That was amazing. That was really amazing. I think uh, you're, you're, you're laying it out all uh, out for us. It's a big picture. Very, very, very good. We are very thankful that you are holding on to the word of the Lord to us as a mission of giving a Bible to every every home. Um, we are engaged with this, as you know. Sweden is engaged now. Germany is on. Uh, Norway. We. We're doing it, and, and other nations are as well, you know, joining this vision. So we believe it can happen. We believe it can happen in Europe, and we are on the job. And thank you for leading the way in Norway. You know, this year, 2018 and 2019, we're taking 200,000 homes almost with the Bible. How many homes do you have? Divide by five. We have... One point something million, one point, no, we have two, almost two million homes. All right. So 10% then in 2018, well, 2019. You have two million homes. Wouldn't that be right? Five million people? You have five million people. 5.4, yeah. One, one million homes, average worldwide, okay. Yeah, but maybe, we, uh, we, maybe have, smaller families. we have small families, you know. <laughs> All, right. All right, so you have to work harder now. Yeah, we still, have, we still have a way to go. But thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. I'm wondering, Lauren, if we can take two minutes before, you, before we, let, we have a stretch break here, but I'm wondering, could we have a couple of feedbacks? What do we remain with? What, what stands out here? But I would like three or four people from three or four different nations. Very, very short. And come up here and, and, and speak into the microphone and just quick feedbacks. What, what, what sticks with us after having heard this? So who would be bold and, and stand up and, and get to the front here and share just quickly? YWAMers are all introverts. Yeah, yeah, no, but there's a British guy coming here. Come on. Listen, obey, don't quit. That was Kyle from, from England. Okay, two, three more. Now we have Mr. Jan from Norway. Come on, Jan. Lauren, we were seeking God, and we asked, God, what are you saying? And he gave exactly the same story from the Bible, you know, about the bread and, and, uh, and the fish. And the same day, we merged two schools to, uh, to one to go to Greece. So that is amazing. I think it's really the word of God for us that we, we do that. What do we have in the hands? I think that's really a key word for us and a key for multiplication. All right, and in the way, you're going to bless Stavanger in that area because uh, you can't bless others without getting blessed. Uh, we are warming up now, so we are getting practice, okay? All right. All and right. by the way, Lauren, I, I was in Papua New Guinea, and I spoke to Barua, and, and he took the inspiration, and he said, how do we do it in, in Papua New Guinea? So you had told him that we have to start with one village. So I did that. I just was not the first white missionary in one village. And we gathered some money from Norway and we shipped our Bibles. We're going in PNG too. Here we go. Okay. Good. Yeah. Great. All right. Okay. A couple Let of more. Just say, you, you also think about, we have a brand new base in Luxembourg. Think about all of you teaming up and, and one day get to every home in Luxembourg. And, uh, Pick out another country, you know, I don't know, another one like uh, Macedonia, and get every home in Macedonia. And then also do your own. There'll, there'll be a lot of lift as you do that. Luxembourg, that's 500,000 people there. That will be 200,000 homes, would it? No. Less. 100,000 homes. 100, yeah. Wow. Well, well, okay, let's be. hear from Greece. Hi. Um, one of the takeouts were uh, we are the fish in the, in the baskets being mul multiplied and take what you have and go big. <laughs> yes, got to yeah. do the big part. Do you know, Lauren, that YWAM Greece now is officially registered in Greece? Wonderful. Yeah, we had to have some Greeks to do it, though. <laughs> <laughs> I know that Judy and Jim were out there pioneering in yeah. Salonika, yeah. and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been a long road, but uh, we're so thrilled for that. I think we have three locations now in Greece, last I heard. Yeah, that's right. Okay, last comment from, yeah, from the Netherlands, slash Norway. <laughs> yeah, so I heard a multiplication, you have what it takes. Yes, already it's available to us. Yeah, that's, that's right. Good. All right, thank you very much. We will have a five minute stretch break and we make it five minutes. So that's five. Now your sound is on. Okay. Okay, please, friends, let's gather together. Those who are playing the piano so wonderfully, please stop. <laughs> um, all right, I think we'll. Dar Darlene, I think we'll just give it straight over to you. And Dar I just spoke with Darlene on, on the phone, and, and she said that if we have questions, we may interrupt. So if some of you, among you, have a question, you come to Judy if you have any questions, okay? And then we'll try to, to see if it fits or not. Is that okay? If you have any questions. So Judy is the... She'll answer, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Darlene. Ready for peace, go? Yeah, come on. I'm so glad to see all of you. And I've really been so excited about this leadership training model that you're doing. I try to keep up with what's happening with you. And 
I know so many things happen on so many levels when we come together, that we learn together, but we learn from each other so much. And we also have these opportunities to a dream with God, get the strengths from one another. And we know we're moving into this time of real fruitful partnerships. But as Lauren was talking about his assignment was really to talk about Europe and God's heart for Europe. And as Andreas and I were just talking, you know, it is always has to be the whole of the world. And I was thinking back to when God called Lauren and myself to Europe. You'll remember the story of God speaking to Lauren that we were to go, I was speaking to both Lauren and myself that we were to start schools. And God clearly spoke that the first school was to, talk, was to start in Switzerland. And what this came from was some really um, deep pondering in our hearts. The mission had been going about five years and we were seeing addition. We were seeing God could use young people. There were amazing things happen. Nobody ever thought any young people would go with us and sure enough, they did. We could see that there was personal transformation that led to transformation of a village and a group of people. But when one time we were going down the road and Lauren said to me, Darb, what do you think's wrong with my leadership? I said, I don't know, I thought you're a pretty good leader. He said, we're only seeing addition, not multiplication. And he said, I'm, we'll never see anything like the waves of young people that I saw at the rate we're going. Too long of a story to go into right now. But in that next month, God looks, God spoke to Lauren and I both separately. We went through a lot of real fire of God in our hearts, some real purging, both of us about the same things, though he was in New Zealand and I was in California. And at the end of that time, God spoke to us about starting a school that the school was to be modular, that there was to be impartation that came from the teachers because they were actively doing what they said they were speaking about. That we were not just to have people that understood the theory, though they needed to be wise and skillful and, and understanding about what the subject matter was, but that they were also walking in faith and doing what they were speaking about, which gave the impartation to us of faith to go out and apply it. That these schools were always to be, people were first to do it and then teach it, but then we were to go out and apply it. Lauren talked about a starting there in Europe. And then of course, he's always had before us the whole of the world. Remember when Lauren was called by God, it was to go into the whole of the world when he was called as a child. It's never been just one place. But God gives each of us a focus many times into one place he's called us to be, but always it's to carry the world with us. So in those early days in Switzerland, as God was giving us his heart, not just for Europe, but always for all of the world, I was thinking as Lauren was speaking about those early days and the fact that our multiplication came always out of prayer. These were the days when God was so emphasizing to us hearing the word of the Lord and prayer. But as I look back to those times, and those early multiplications of many of the places that you presently are serving, probably I could tell you about the prayer meeting that sent us and called us into that group of people. That when God spoke to us about going to Afghanistan, when God spoke to us about Germany, when God spoke to us about Spain, when God spoke about Albania, when it was all coming from the place of prayer. So as we are in that new season now, not a, really a new season, I shouldn't say that, but as you are in the season where we are of multiplication, desiring to see Europe change, desiring to see the world change, please always remember that we are a people that have been gone, sent 
God has emphasized seeking him in detail. Whenever we stray from that, friends, we just don't get it right. And all that early multiplication, all the vision for the world that God gave us in those early days in Switzerland came from being on our faces in prayer. So as we think about multiplication across Europe, as we think about reaching where he's put on our heart, prayer must always be a very essential part. In that days of rapid multiplication, there were also tremendous waves of repentance that came across us. Absolutely always looking to walk with clean hearts. No offense towards one another. No offense towards anything that God was trying to pick up and teach us. And I want us, I want us to understand as we think about multiplication, as we think about doing whatever he's called us to do, that hearing the word of the Lord, having joy-filled life of repentance and transformation of our thinking and our ways is absolutely essential. One of the things we recognize that God's doing at this time is this tremendous growth in both the body of Christ and in the mission. It it's just is happening. And we've never seen a time more that we would have in, are in the place for fruitful partnerships and God is giving us great partnerships. But as I was thinking back to these original words while Lauren was, um, but original time in Switzerland, I should say, while Lauren was speaking, I was thinking about God didn't give partnerships in the same way as he's doing now. But if you can think, we started this mission in Europe with two Americans, with mostly American students, and we came in there with this global mission that was on our heart. We were going to be international. That was where our heart was. We certainly didn't look like it. We didn't have a variety of languages amongst us. We didn't have a variety of cultures. We were just us with this heart for the international, and we're sure that God wanted us to be a global movement. I think back now and think, how could people like Auntie Corrie Tin Boom give all of her influence vouchers to this little group that were meeting there in Switzerland? Or a brother Andrew, and later even Billy Graham. The way we're partners, they gave us partnership and gave us their influence which also influenced the growth of the mission. Absolutely amazing to me. So as we think now and we fast forward to where we are in Europe, what we're talking about really is what happened 40 years ago there in Europe as we started there in Switzerland. We have seen this multiplication. We're seeing multiplication around the world. And it's a new time of fruitful partnerships. In 2006, God gave the word for us to convene and converge. The word convene means just that you bring people together. When we talk about when we're driving and we see a sign and it says the roads are going to converge, it means that two roads are going to become one. So when we convene people, we, bring, we convene people from different areas and places. We converge together to say, what is it that we can do that will make something happen that is more effective with us being together than us being separate? It's always been in our hearts, friends, as a mission to be good partners to any group of people. We have been seen always uh, through the years, you know, sort of, I don't know how to explain it very well, but sort of like Wyman was always the little brother <laughs> amongst the bigger brothers. We were those people that had all these energetic, enthusiastic young people. They say short coming. They've got great hearts, but you know, there's not too much staying power with those young people. Well, we're over 50 years old now, and there's a whole lot of people that have been staying. We can't, 
that we are no longer that, but we sort of even still think of ourselves that way. One of the places where partnership has been so fruitful is the subject that Laura was ending with when he talked about end Bible poverty now. The Bible translators, uh, some place, um, the, the Bible translation like of the Wycliffe, the Wycliffe people, they probably have more PhDs in their organization than any other missions movement. They are a remarkable group of people. And they go, and people go into uh, some remote area, give 20 years maybe of their life translating the Bible. What a wonderful calling they have on their lives. But it's taking so long. And about eight years ago, a group of YWAMers, young people, who have really an understanding of more modern technology and what can happen when you get the right software, what happens with IT and what happens in technology, this digital generation. And they begin to think about eight ways that they can help Bible translation. And they begin to say, hey, if we did these steps for you ahead of time, maybe it would make a difference and speed up your work. And we begin to have partnerships with those that are involved with the translating the Bible, whether it was orality, hearing, uh, hearing faith comes by hearing, the, the, the um, I'm trying to think of the word, the, the, um, the, the movies, the, the Bible film that we're doing, the Jesus film, that's the word. You'd think I could remember the word Jesus, wouldn't you? Uh, the Jesus film, all of these different groupings of people coming together in a fruitful partnership has made a tremendous difference. Think about what's happening to call, call to all. All of the different denominations and groups and movements that are, have met together, that is fruitful partnerships. We are seeing here, particularly uh, across the U.S., so many of the young evangelists and people involved in the, what we would almost call the Jesus movement in the U.S. are coming together with Youth of the Mission and other groupings, and we're seeing such fruitfulness. So we've seen it in evangelism, we're seeing it in training, and we want to learn how to be more fruitful in our connections within the spheres. Though there are all kinds of fruitful relationships that God wants us to have. And we must, in order to have fruitful relationships, there are some things that we've been able to learn. I've asked quite a few questions. We had a group of our, what we call the founder circle, which is pretty well just a small group of people that are from various parts of the, of the mission. Most of them are people that have a lot of experience and have sort of like worn to my eldership circle. And we had a good discussion there on what does it take to have a fruitful partnership. Ken Mulligan, who works with the ships, he has been able to make many fruitful partnerships with this, those in the spheres in order to see the mercy ministries part of the uh, call of God on the ship come together in a quite a remarkable way. David Hamilton has worked so much with fruitful partnerships starting with what they call Table 71 for, that was about 16 years ago when a whole group of people from different denominations and movements happened to be sitting at Table 16, 71, and they were the ones that said, okay, how can we get the gospel out? How can we get the task done? And they begin to meet for the last 16 years, twice a year. Tremendous initiatives have come out of that. That is where Call to All started. That is much of where David Hamilton, working with that group of people, started to having all these convenings and convergings of those people that are involved in Bible translation and other ways of getting God's word out. So I asked them, I said, what are some of the principles that you have learned that makes for a fruitful 
partnership? What are some of the things that we need to be thinking about? And I just wanted to give you a, a few of those for you to ponder. As soon as I can see where I put my notes. One of the things is that you must in that partnership, in those that you convene and converge together, you must have a shared purpose. What is our reason for, reason for getting together? What is the purpose that we've come to get together? For one, it was how can we do Bible translation better? For another, in fruitful partnership within the spheres, what can we do in the case of Ken Mulligan? Can we do with taking the, uh, the opportunity of the ship to come and see a, a, um, a place transformed? Can we bring in education? Can we bring in the medical? What can we do to help with government? They were all coming together. The ship was the, the basket, so to speak, of that Lauren was speaking about, or the vessel, or the reason. But they were convening those from the various parts of the, of the spheres to say, what can we bring? And so as we convene with those in the spheres, they don't have to be Christian for us to convene with them, but they have to be committed to truth and they have to recognize we come in with the biblical principles and purpose. And if that can't be part of the shared purpose, it's not going to work. So that will not be a fruitful partnership. So we have to have that shared purpose. And they have to recognize what our purpose is. We must always have a servant posture. Most of the time, you have been asked to be a part of that partnership, that convening, that converging of that group, because you represent youth with the mission. Most of the time, people look at us and they see this vast power source, all this manpower is there. They often think we have lots of resources, which we don't have the kind of resources where we can say, oh, we're going to have commit to this 500,000 from this fund and another thousand from this. We do have a riches and resources. But when you come together with them, you are representing the mission at large and you must also, we must always have a servant posture. They brought you in because of what they see in the influence of what you personally may have or the influence sometimes that they perceive we have in all of youth with the mission. But whatever it is that you've been brought into, you better be sure you have some authority and some experience. I don't mean authority given to you from a leadership point of view. I mean authority because you have done what it is. If you're coming in to talk about Bible translation, you at least understand some of the concepts of what they're working with. Whatever it is that you've been, you have some experience. But once you're in that partnership, the youth of the mission title goes away. You are not there to promote this mission. You're there to say whatever we are and we can serve you, we will do. You, you, you were brought in because you, they, they, you are an influencer. They recognize your background is in white wham. But when we come to that table, we are servant leaders and we want to serve in any way we can, not promote our mission. Does that make sense? Do you get that? It's not that we're not YWAMers, but we're not there to promote mission. Judy, do you want to say something? You look like you did. Yeah? No? Okay. Miss Redder. When you do that, you earn trust. The speed of a partnership can only go at the same speed that the mutual trust between the members is. There is the, the partnership won't work, friends, unless there's mutual trust. 
And if we go in only looking to bless YWAM, only looking to promote YWAM, there will not be mutual trust. From the very beginning of this mission, thinking way back to those early days, when we were invited any place, it was always to serve, not to lead. YWAMers were the one that set up the chairs. We were the ones that found the translators. We were the ones that said, how can we do anything? And we to this day should be that same way. We are always looking for the areas that we can serve. Now that we're 50 years old, now we have more maturity. Now we have more ability to help give leadership into anything. But it must be servant leadership. We must always have a faith-filled perspective. It must always be not our strength, our manpower, our group, our partnership. If we all get this all together, we can really make this happen. We must be people that always say, without God, it's not going to happen. We must always be the people who have this faith-filled perspective and making space for that. We have to have a lot of restraint. We have a lot of self-control. We have to do a lot of listening. We have to be people that look to hear other people's perspective. And when we don't agree with that perspective, we must be careful how we disagree. These, these relationships, friends, are really precious. And sometimes when we're in these kind of groupings, we really are kind of surprised at how much we know. <laughs> we, we, we've been in fruitful partnerships probably since pretty well the time you started in YWAM because we believe in team. So we honestly, we know quite a bit about these things, but we don't, we have to, within that context, when somebody else is leading these partnerships, we have to be really good listeners. One of the things in the partnership is always from our point of view, doing the best we can, friends, to keep the unity, to be the people that encourages. It's one of the gifts God's given us. We are people that really have worked from the beginning of this mission to promote unity. And we must work within those partnerships to keep on keeping that role. Um, the Stanford Institute, Stanford University, had a course that they taught on partnerships. And these are the five things that they put together in order to have a fruitful partnership. And maybe there are some that we could ponder as well. Said so the five elements of movements and partnerships. Now remember, this is not a Christian group. This is a secular college. One, the elements of movement and partnerships are that they have a common agenda that is bigger than all of them. They have a common standard and measurement for success. They have a clear way for everyone to contribute and good on-ramps for information. There was just a, a, a meeting that was happening up at King's that David Hamilton was leading, who has been involved probably in so many different kinds of partnerships. And I was so impressed in his leadership in that he made it clear, how do we contribute? that no person was able to occupy the full time of speaking, that he would make sure as he went around the group, oh, what was your opinion? How did you want to, did you want to add to this? And so in whatever those partnerships are, friends, make sure that there's an easy on-ramp to know how to contribute. 
that there's a way at the end of that contribution that the partnership's able to see, did we hit our goals? How are we gonna go forward? Continuous information is important. This is, what, this is what Stanford said. They want to be sure and let people know that they are moving towards the goal. Now this, this is what they said. Partnerships advance trust. We know that that is extremely important. I think for us, that's the end of the Stanford one, so I'm not being Stanford now. I think for us in YWAM, it's important that we understand what is our lane? What is it that we can contribute? So you need to know, Lauren briefly mentioned the Christian Magna Carta. But guys, that is a really good, that is a really good thing to look at as you are a part of partnerships. Is this, is this partnership going to help in the things that we as YWAM say are in our lane? And the Christian Magna Carta is very broad. But know what we're called to. And also remember always, we are youth with a mission. And any time we work where there are young people, there's a blessing of God. So when we're in these partnerships, our young people, whether it's schools and outreaches, the, sometimes some of the least experienced of us, they have a contribution to make. So as you are a part of any partnership, remember, we're always representing youth. And we want to make sure that there's a place for youth in whatever we're doing. Not everybody in the YWAM is unexperienced. Not everybody's here for short term. We've got lots of people. You represent all those that are just our long term. We've, we, we have that. But always, if we put within our lane some way to include young people, I believe it makes the heart of God glad because we have been called to be youth with a mission. And that's part of the lane and that's part of who we are. And I think in these fruitful partnerships, particularly as I look and the one I'm probably closest to is this whole thing on in Bible poverty now. The use of young people has just accelerated everything that's happening in every category. They are the manpower that helps get the Bible out. They are now the people that are helping with some of the translation, using technology. The whole thing with word by heart has been so advancing what people think about, even how the Bible can be heard. And all of these things, we have young people involved. And for us, I believe in fruitful partnerships, young people must always be a part of that. I'm trying to think about how to make this a bit shorter. Um, In this fruitful partnership, we must recognize who we are and what God has called us to. Let's not try to be something we're not, friends. We are a youth movement. We are called to the spheres. Be really aware of our calling. Don't get into partnerships that are, are in some way uh, different than our calling. Don't look to run uh, in these partnerships. Don't look to just um, run parallel services, but let's look to put our services together when it works. When it doesn't, let's not do that. But as God's calling us to these partnerships across the body of Christ, God wants us to be fruitful in them. He's called us to convene and converge. And these fruitful partnerships, we can do that. He's also called us within the mission to convene and converge. And in many ways, if you are part of this LDS, this modular time, you convene together and you converge on these ideas and God's giving great fruit from it. As we moved into the mission to thinking in circles, cycles and circuits, as we put these various circles together and seen such um, a wonderful advancement in leadership, 
we also have been convening and converging at new levels. So when we convene and converge in these ways, it's absolutely amazing what God can do. We want to be people that are relevant in this time. This big wave that God's given us, we want to catch it. There is momentum in this wave. It is really happening, guys. We just had the reports of our, of our outreach students. Never have we had reports with so many salvations taking place. So many remarkable healings as we're seeing now. So much multiplication. So we want to have these, why don't we be prepared and be fruitful in catching this wave? As I try to bring this a bit to a close, what kind of people do we need to be to be able to be catching this wave and be fruitful in the future? Be committed to partnerships that are fruitful. As YWAMers, let's be committed to be involved and create new coursework that helps give tools for what we're to do in the future. This is the season, friends, for multiplication of the university and new relevant coursework that will contribute to what God wants us to be in the future. You've probably heard some of you about us putting the university in a box that when God gave this ship that could take containers, the big question was, why is God giving a ship that takes containers? And as we've been pondering these things, on this university in a box, we're beginning to see all kinds of doors open because we were innovative in thinking about that. Let's be people that think and minister into the spheres and let's keep asking God for innovative strategies for reaching the spheres. How can we be what God wants us to be in the transformation of spheres? I think we're working on this, but we need to keep working more, is how to have structures that accommodate our growth. How do we expand leadership? How do, we have new, the, how do we expand the leadership to multiply the concepts that God has given us? We're always looking for leadership opportunities for others. That happens in our partnerships. It happens in our teams. It happens in our leadership. Our job in leadership, friend, is to release others, not just build our own leadership. You'll remember that God spoke to us in 2011 after the 50th when we said, when we said to the Lord, okay, what do Lauren and myself do about transition now? I said, I don't want you to use that word transition. I want the word leadership expansion. And we have been looking in every way, friends, all of you, as you have transitions coming up or you were a part of any transition, Always think about how do we expand the leadership? And I pulled back farther, but I remain an appropriate part of the team and I keep giving away leadership more and more and more. You know, Lauren and I have never led a boring life. <laughs> We've had such wonderful, wonderful opportunities in God. But we often say to each other, and now in this season, Never has it been more exciting. We are so um, proud, I think, is that any parent is proud of a child that accomplishes a lot. You have the dreams that you had for them in your heart when they were first born. And you, you've given to them and given to them and given them. And then you see they become a mature adult and they begin to accomplish that vision and that dreams. And then they have children and you watch their children grow and they become mature with good characters and great dreams. That's sort of how we feel about YWAM, guys. Well, I look at you and I want to ask you all kinds of questions. Well, how's it going about this? And how, what's happening there? We're, we're just so thrilled with what God's doing. And this expansion that's happening now, friends, we can't hold it back in any way. 
And we must always be looking not to build our own leadership, but how can we give leadership away? And there, you know, give and it shall be given unto you. You never give away your leadership. You still have leadership. He, God still has plenty of places for you to express it. But when you give it away, the truth is you just get more. Don't be afraid of that. And, and just, I know I'm always on this one, but I just want to say, remember we are youth with a mission. That's the dream God had in his heart when he called us into being. So whatever you're doing, youth is, should be the majority. And remember, we can trust young people. That's why God called us to be youth with a mission. So never move away from that. We have been given this special gift by God as a mission to empower young people to see personal transformation in young people's lives and give them the tools to see transformation in society. This is one of the most exciting things we could ever be involved in. You be a people who are committed to walk in the joy of the Lord. No matter what our circumstances are, and those of you that are working there in Europe with refugees, Finding the joy of the Lord in those difficult, difficult situations is not always easy. But we must always remember to be loyal to God, that there's never been anything wrong with God and there never will be. That we understand his sovereignty, that we get our own souls encouraged so that we can walk in the joy of the Lord. Always, in all circumstances, we must be a people that are looking for the goodness of God. Do your work for the glory of God, not the glory of yourself or the glory of this mission. Understand who we are as a mission. Understand what we are calling those four legacy words, the main words that God spoke to us, that it was the waves, young people from everywhere, going everywhere, doing new things when it is required. Those things that are involved in the Christian Magna Carta that Lauren mentioned to you. God giving us the university because he expects us to do something that will influence the spheres. And I personally think we're way behind in that. But I know God will put us into these fruitful partnerships that will help speed that up and also give us greater understanding about the tool called University of the Neighbors. Be generous with your time, with your praise, with your encouragement, and with your, with your finances. Generosity has to be a part of who we are. We are people to be that are also grateful for all that God has done. We look to be a people that are continually expressing and having a heart of gratefulness. I don't really have to say this one to you guys because you're doing it because I can see you right now. But keep yourself on a learning curve. Always be learning. Seek to love God with all of your mind. And also always remember to be a person that presses in, reads good books and talks to others about it. And we also know that where the Lord talked about the soil, where the seed was planted and there was a fruitful harvest, was where they could give understanding. Seek to be a people that understands and when we ask people to do things or when we talk about things, we can always give understanding for why we're doing what we're doing. The next would be keep connected to the whole of the family of YWAM. Be committed to one another. I know you are because of you're all coming together. 
But when there, when there are gatherings, like the Thailand gathering this, that's coming up at the end of the summer and into the fall, YWAM together internationally. You meet people that are there because the family's not together if you're not there. You, you always look to be in where, where the conveners are saying, let us convene and converge. You're not one saying, oh, I really don't have the time or they're not gonna talk about anything I'm really interested in. Doesn't matter either one of those things. We've been called to be a people that gather together to seek God. Maybe if you'd go, they would be talking about something more relevant. Maybe they would hear from God better. But we, where I oftentimes hear people being critical about something so they don't go, well, why don't you go and try to contribute and change it? When, years ago, when I started putting all the values together, friends, all, and I remember one young man coming to me in a leadership school and he said, Darlene, you gotta write these things down. We weren't there but you're constantly saying, when we were gathered together, God spoke to us this or that. So as you are gathered together, I expect God to speak to you directional words. This is what he has done to us for years and we have to have a respect for that. It's, uh, we're, as we're getting bigger, it's getting harder to do that. God's gonna be showing us new ways as a mission, as a university to convene and converge. I know that. But I do know that Thailand is the time when God's called us all to be together. So that shouldn't be something, oh, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to go. You expect to go because you are part of this mission. And it'll be different if God says no, then you have to obey that. But the automatic is yes, because God's called us to gather together. So always be looking for, and looking for convening and converging in fruitful partnerships, not just outside the mission with other organizations, but, out, but within the mission. And that's what you're doing as you're brought together. Be committed to one another and partner as many ways as possible. Don't just be interested in your particular but you'd be interested in the whole. Be committed to walking in holiness and righteousness. I look back to those early days in Switzerland when God was teaching us so much. That's when communism was so strong all around us was when we had to press in and know what we believed and why we believed it. It was where God was putting the very seeds for multiplication. We were just so amazed when we look back at, at what God did in those first five years. At the time, it didn't seem like anything big. You were just obeying the next thing that God spoke to us. But in the midst of it, friends, there was always these great levels of repentance and obedience and transparency. Now, maybe we just had more sin in our lives than we have now. I don't know that, <laughs> but I don't think so. I just think that we, that we need to keep in these partnerships that we have, this convening, this converging. We need to keep being before the Lord, a mutually accountable. How are you doing in your marriage? How are you doing in your family? How are you doing in your leadership? that we give opportunities for us to be sure that we're walking in transparency and that we're walking in obedience. Because all of you know, this is sort of my hobby horse, but I, I'm telling you this, when people get offended with one another, when we pick up these offenses, the trick of the enemy is always to help us, to, to try to encourage us to be offended with somebody. Because if he can get you offended, you begin to lose your vision. There is no creativity in the place of offense. Their vision begins to go down. So it's his absolute, I believe, first line of strategy to stop fruitfulness is to cause division. 
That's why when we're talking about having fruitful partnerships, friends, we have to guard the unity. We have to be the people that are first to say, uh, I'm sorry. We have to be the first people to humble ourselves because we're not moving anywhere if we pick up these fence and if there's arrogance amongst us. And I, I just can't encourage this enough, friends, that nothing will stop our growth or our fruitfulness, our partnerships, if we get ourselves offended with one another. We want to be as people committed to unity. And you know, if you're committed to unity and we truly love one another, there's just no place for gossip or slander. There's only the place for us to walk in repentance with one another, to not hold an offense, to be the people that are quick to humble ourselves. I'm not saying we don't have differences that we have to walk through and get sorted out. We all have miscommunication. We all do stupid stuff that hurts one another. I'm not talking about not making any of that right. Of course we make it right. We have to learn how to better communicate. We have to, we have to be open when we're hurt or we're disappointed. That's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a hard thing that says, I respect you because Jesus is in you and Jesus is in me. Surely we can figure this thing out because we together want to change the world. We together want to see these things happen. And, and we will not have fruitful partnerships of any kind, friends, if we don't do that both either within or without the mission. So be committed to walking in that lifestyle of holiness. Always walking through with Matthew 18. And, and I think the thing that's most important for us is to have great respect for Jesus in each other. Sure, it's a different expression. We don't all do things the same way. Nor should we. The Bible talks so much about our different gifts. Remember there in Romans 12? Have your mind renewed. Don't think too highly of yourself. <laughs> Look at yourself with sober judgment. I remember Judy Orrin some years ago speaking on the hardest person to lead was yourself. And I, I found that to be true. But, and then the, in the Bible, it goes on and it begins to talk about all the variety of gifts and ends up, you know, chapter, I think it's about 15, talks about love. And let, let, we, we have to, in order to be fruitful in the future, to catch this wave and flow with it, those areas must always be there. Live the values, live our beliefs, live what God's called us to be. And we will be fruitful, not because we're so wonderful, but because he's so wonderful. This wave of young people from everywhere, going everywhere. Guys, it's picking up. <laughs> it's picking up. <laughs> that wave is picking up. There's more momentum than we have ever known in the past. And there is more need for this convening, for this converging and fruitful partnerships. I understand you're going to have a stadium event. What a remarkable opportunity to bring people together, to convene and converge, to have that apostolic message go out and then all of us do our part to be able to make that event not just be an event, but one that has lasting fruit. Each of us have different gifts to bring about. One gift might be more showy, more upfront. That doesn't mean the less showy gifts, as the Bible notice, is less important. So let's take all of our gifts and put it together. This is the time where there is fruitfulness. This is a time where we're seeing the soil is well prepared. In some places, the soil just needs a little more ingredients of one thing or another, and it will really be good. Just like the farmer has to add some phosphate or something else in the soil for it to be fruitful. That's part of what you discern. What is this soil and what will make it more fruitful? 
What is the understanding that we can give so that there will be a greater harvest of what's planted in this seed? Lauren spoke about the feeding of the 5,000. And as he talked about that, I was thinking about we are the baskets. <laughs> we are the one that holds the bread and fish. So sometimes we're the, we're the people that pass it out, but other times we're the basket that grab, that gathers the bread together and helps others pass it out. Whatever part of that is, we know God is the multiplier but we know we also have been called to action. I wanna bless you in what you're doing there. I know you're gonna have some fruitful days together. I know as we come together, God meets us in that place. I know that every one of you that are a part of this program are a part of it, not because Andreas called you, but because God called you. There are, I know that there are fruitful partnerships sitting across from the table from one another continuously. Partnerships that will be fruitful and will be lasting. And I just want to thank you each for your obedience to what you're doing for God or as God's called you. We are doing it for him because he called us to do it. You've been obedient. And so we want to take that obedience and we want to see it multiplied, starting with the first row, right to the back row. We just hold the basket and God does his thing. We want to plant the seed in the places that he wants us to do it. We want to add what's needed in, that, in the soil, but we want to also learn how to harvest. Not all crops are harvested the same way. Some are hand-picked. Some of the harvesting comes with a big shovel and they take a whole lot of it. The, some harvest, you have to be on a ladder. Some you have to be on your knees. Harvest doesn't happen all the same way. But we know who the Lord of the harvest is. And he's the one that's called us. And I just need to end this by saying, I'm so glad to serve him with you. I'm so glad for the call of God that he's put on his li our lives. And I just want to bless you in your obedience to him. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, darling. I think that what has happened now is that first we had Lauren sharing the big picture. And what is the big picture? He said, do not think Europe alone. Think the world. And what is the goal? What is the vision? Well, it's transformation. It's transformation. Second layer. How will it happen? It's happening through the Word of God, through the Bible. Third layer, Darlene has given us now. What is it about? How can it happen? Partnership. So then you have the three layers. Transformation of the nations through the Word of God, happening through YWAMers being involved with partnership with others. And I think, Darlene, that you beautifully have, have given us a recipe, so to speak, for, for how partnership should happen. Yeah. And yeah. I really, I really enjoyed what you said, that it's not about YWAM. It's, it's not about bringing our, you know, it's not building our kingdom. We are laying down those rights when we come to the table. Yes. And we serve, right. we serve the purpose. We don't serve ourselves. We serve the purpose. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we've seen that so many times over the last years, doing exactly that. And, yes. and the result is so much greater. Yeah. By walking together. So, um, all right. I'm wondering, it's late now, um, but still I want to have a room for a couple of comments or questions. If there are. We will unpack this later on. So do not be afraid. Uh, we will unpack this more later, but I'm just wondering now as we're having Darlene here, is there any comments or, or, or questions that you feel, I, yeah, I want to ask this or I want to say this? So we take time for that for a couple of people, if there are anyone. Yeah, it's very good. There's a couple of comments there in the, in the room. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it then.
Good night. <laughs> I'm just starting my day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I go a long time, but I'm I'm not a night person, so I really feel for you. You better <laughs> say good night. Thank you very much, Darlene. We bless you You're in the name welcome. of Jesus, and we're very thankful. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. So, thank you. So, as I said, we will unpack this later on. Um, tomorrow will be a full. Tomorrow is the most full day. So I'll encourage you: do not stay up too late. I feel like a teenage dad saying that. <laughs> I am a teenage dad. Yeah. Um, we are me we are starting here with worship 8:30. All right? So see you tomorrow then. <laughs>